This is a special report from CBS News in Washington. The Congress and Cosa Nostra. The story of Joseph Valachi's testimony today before Senator McClellan's investigating subcommittee. To destroy the whole, uh, the whole uh, syndicate, the whole organization. The whole, that's right, yeah. Why do you feel like it should be destroyed? Well, uh, through the years, uh, I've, uh, first of all, I want revenge. Second of all, they've been uh, very, uh, uh, I say, uh, very bad to the soldiers. And uh, they've been thinking for themselves all through the years. In other words, it's all, pu all put together. I can put together a number of, you know, so many things that it all comes to all one to destroy them. There are just many reasons that add up to the fact right. you don't think that such an organization should be permitted to operate, to That's exist. Right. Is yeah. that correct? That's right. Uh, as the senator put it before, what did I get out of it? What did you get out Nothing of it? Nothing but misery. Uh, all, you know, I, as you all understand, once you're in, you're in, you can't get out. Good evening. This is Roger Mudd. The sworn testimony you just heard came from the lips of Joseph Vellacci, lips that supposedly were sealed 33 years ago when he joined America's underworld crime syndicate, Cosa Nostra. But today, before a spellbound Senate hearing, televised nationally, the 60-year-old Valachi talked, and talked in such a way that this convicted dope peddler, burglar, and murderer seemed to draw the sympathy of the crowd and the McClellan Committee. Valachi said today he was talking because he wanted revenge. But it is also possible he was talking for self-protection, because his syndicate boss, Vito Genovese, had ordered him killed as an informer. The two men shared a cell in the Atlanta Penitentiary, and Genovese had heard from one of Valachi's co-defendants in a narcotics case that he had become an informer. One night last year, after the cell block lights had been turned off, Valachi said Genovese let him know it. He said, you know, sometimes uh, you buy a barrel of apples, you know, and uh, one of these apples is touched. Is touched? Touched. Touch means a little touch. Not all rotten, but a little touch. True. I see. He said, uh, that apple... Uh, has to be removed, or it'll touch the rest of the apples. What significance did that have to you? Just shaking my head and listening to him. I said, what significance did that have to I you? I was just shaking my head and listening to him. You were shaking your head and listening. All right, go ahead. And, uh, in fact, I was doing it now unconsciously. As I was telling you, I was shaking my head. I just caught myself. Yeah, all right, go ahead. That is what you were doing. So with that, he says, I think we go to sleep. He got up and he said, uh, grab my hand and he gave me a kiss. Grabbed your hand and gave you a kiss? He gave me a kiss. Yeah. So I turned around and I gave him a kiss on the other side. Yeah. And, uh, is that some uh, ritual that goes along in your organization? No, this is a suspicious kiss. This is a suspicious yeah. kiss. Very well. Very well, go ahead. <laughs> so with that, uh, I sleep on the left bottom bunk, and Ralph Wagon sleeps on the right bottom bunk. See, we have one bunk on top of the other, see. Ralph mumbled under his breath, hmm, the kiss of death. Ralph Wagner mumbled that. Yeah. I see. I ignored them. You ignored it. Go yeah. ahead. Naturally, I, uh, I uh, lay down and uh, trying to figure out all night, you know. And uh, I even noticed he used to take peeps to see if I was asleep because he was across me, see, Vito Genovese. Well, I, I must admit I was upset. Did you know what Genovese was talking about at that time? when? Not, he, not yet. You didn't yet know? No. But it had a meaning to you? Oh, yeah. As I said, you know. You, you, you knew what it meant, but kiss. you didn't know why he did it yet. Well, look, uh, an outsider got wise, Senator. A what? An outsider, like Ralph. Yeah. He got wise. He was wise. He even was wise. So what, what, ain't I supposed to be smart? You know, 
In other words... And may the... I ask you, Senator Curtis, here yes, suggest, and I think as yeah. well, did you at the time accept and regard that as a kiss of death? Yeah, but I, that's why I say I didn't answer Ralph. That's the reason why I said that. I, yeah, but I was... I didn't think the kid would get it. You didn't think the kid would get it? But right. the kid got it. Either. He got it. So uh, I... would it be... How can I miss when he got it? Yeah. All right, I, I don't think you missed. But, yeah, one, just one other idea. One other. Now, you're kissing him in return. Is that a, a, a practice? It was uh, to make him understand I was smart to him. You were what? Smart to him on that kiss. That's why I kissed him back. He was smart. He understood what he meant. You, you... That morning I come out, of the, I come out and uh, actually I was really uh, at a state. I didn't know what to do. I walked up and Were down. Were you in a state of fear? Yeah, yeah. Afraid for your life? I walked up and down about once, twice. I made about... Go ahead. I made one lap of a distance of about four blocks. The, the yard is about, I say, four blocks long. Then I made another lap, and then I made another one, and then on my way back, I spot Joe Beck. Uh, I could have spotted Mike Coppola. I could have spotted any one of these guys. It wouldn't have made any difference to me. Well, it happened to be uh, near a construction. And uh, I, as soon as I saw him, I actually, I don't know what I thought I found. Where were you on your way to at the time? Well, I was on my way from walking. Now, I found him in front of me. You found him in front of from, from fr In front of me, yeah. And who was behind you? Well, uh, he was walking with another guy. And right away, I saw the pipe. I grabbed the pipe, and I went to wake on uh, Joe Beck. At least, that's what I thought it was. You saw a man you thought was Joe Beck. Right. Right in front of him. Right. One of these that you understood were, were, were under orders to kill you. Right, right. You yeah. honestly believe that they were under orders from Genovese to kill you there in prison. Yes, 100 percent, Senator. 100 percent. Yes. So when you saw Joe Beck, who you thought was Joe Beck in front of you, hey. you did what? I uh, hit him on the head with the pipe. And a uh, piece of iron pipe from the construction I, job yeah, there? Well, yeah, that was just, they were building a new industry uh, at this uh, particular uh, place of the yard, yeah. you know, near the, near the end of the ball yeah. stand, grandstand. And you you hit him with that pipe? Yeah. More than once? About three times. About three times. Very hard. Very hard. Yeah. Then what did you do? Well, then I... Uh, I uh, saw a couple of guys running towards me. But I didn't know who they were. See, in my, uh, uh, in my uh, excitement, I could see people, but I can't make them, see? By, by you were in a frenzy, I guess, at that time, wasn't you? Yeah, I would not know how to explain it, Senator. I could you don't see know the, how to explain it. Yeah, I could see the people, uh, because I must tell you that, as, as I found out in the hole after, from other inmates, who these three people were. You didn't know at that time, though? No, I, all I know, they were rushing for me, and I rushed for them. I let go of that guy, and I rushed at them, and they rushed back. It went on like that. You started at them with the pipe, and they went back. I them. went at them, yeah. All right, go ahead. Uh, in other words, uh, they made about two attempts before the officer come over. See? Now, when the officer come over, he wanted to take the pipe off me. I said, no, you don't get this pipe. I said, I'll walk to the associated warden's office, but you don't take this pipe from me. You wasn't going to let him take the pipe. Well, I can't tell him there's a couple of guys trying to get me. You didn't have time to tell him that, did I you? I think if I hand him the pipe, them guys may uh, come at me. So I, every now and then I'm looking behind as I'm walking with the officer. You walked on with the officer to where? All the, the way, warden's office? All the way to the associated warden's office. The associated warden's office. Yeah. And then what happened about him telling you who you had actually assaulted? He showed me a picture. He showed you a picture. That yeah. is the associate warden? Yes, I still don't remember his name. Uh, a picture he showed me, I think it was not a cup, but a first picture he showed me. I said to him, who's this? He says, that's the guy you intended to hit. I oh, know, he says, that's the guy you hit. 
And that's the guy you hit. The and first the, picture he showed. And then he showed me another picture. He took that away. And this is the guy you intended to hit. Well, is that when you first knew that you had hit the wrong man? Yes, Senator. <laughs> you could imagine how I felt. I told him, just lock me up after that. You what? I told him, lock me up after that. I you sank in a, in a chair, you know. You what? I sank in a chair, you know. Sl in I slumped in a chair. You slumped in a chair. Yeah. Senator McIntyre. Joe, in um, view of all these disclosures to the FBI and the justice that you've made, how safe do you feel? At the way I am now. Right now. How, do you, how safe do you feel? Now, at yes. this moment, I feel fine. How would you feel if you went back to prison? Uh, I'll have to protect myself again, Senator. I'll have to kill or be killed again. Would it be, um... If you notice, Senator, I wouldn't say they'd kill me. I'll always fight back, Senator, if I well, go in prison. Would it be fair to say that if you went back to prison that you'd be a dead man? Uh, if they got at me, I, uh, I wouldn't be in there five minutes, Senator. Is it usually possible for the organization to kill somebody when they're in prison? If they want to? The truth? Yes. No. I think he went a little too far, Vito Genovese, in this case. It was at this point, apparently, when Valachi thought Genovese had gone too far, that he decided to sing for protection. An FBI agent was assigned to him full time, and the Justice Department began filling in the blanks on its chart of Cosa Nostra. This is Valachi's great value, says the department. He is the first member of Cosa Nostra publicly to confirm its existence. Senator McClellan is the questioner. May I ask at this time, I don't care to go into details now, but when did you become a member of this organization? 1930. In 1930. What is the name of it? It is... Cosa Nostra in Italian. Cosa Nostra in Italian. Our, uh, our thing and our family in English. Our thing and our family in English. Uh, we'll come back to that later, but that is an organization, is it? Yes. That requires absolute obedience? Yes. And conformity to its policy as handed down by those in authority? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Well, we might ask you at this time, what are the different positions or ratings or rank in that organization? Starting at the top, what do you have? Well, uh, uh, we have uh, what we call agumiacion. Uh, that's sort of like, a, in English, you would express it as a commission. And then we have... That is, as of now, you have... Uh, the commission, but in the past, when the time you joined it, what did you have? Well, they used to have what we call the boss of all bosses. The boss of all bosses. All right. And we had the individual bosses of the individual family. Then we had an underboss. Then we have what we call a cover regime, which is a lieutenant. And we had what we call soldiers. Soldiers? Soldiers. Are yeah. they also called button men? Well, on the outside, they call them button men. So on I mean, the outside, but in the organization, they're called soldiers. Right. So you have, you had the boss of all bosses, then the boss of a family, then the underboss of a family, and then the lieutenants. No. Uh, I meant to say, uh, you want that in Italian, too? Well, yeah. Uh, Uzotagaba is the expression of the underboss. All right, what is the expression of the lieutenant? Cabo regime. All right, now what's the expression of the button men or soldiers? Soldiers. Just soldiers. Just soldiers amongst our own organization. So those were the ranks or levels in the organization. Yes. You say now, however, there is a commission. Does it now have a boss of all bosses? No, no more boss of all boss. They have what you call a consigliere. A consigliere. A consigliere is like, uh, we put, I 
I give it, uh, put it to you this way. Uh, Charlie Luciano, Charlie Lucky, put it in effect, uh, a member of six to protect the soldiers. Because uh, if, a lieutenant, if a lieutenant in the old days uh, had it in for a soldier or he, uh, he want to pick on the soldier, he, he could, uh, you know, he would make up stories. And to protect the soldier, they formed this, uh, what we call, consigliere. Uh, in case of soldiers accused about something, well, then the lieutenant or whoever it may be must bring up charges on him. In other words, that is something that's settled within each family. Right. May that you... be a sort of a kangaroo court? I mean, a kangaroo well, you call it a kangaroo yeah. court. That's right. A court that you set up right. in your own outfit. Right. And about how many soldiers would usually be under a boss? Well, uh, certain families have about, say, uh, Vito Genovese has about 450. 400 in and around that. Yeah, 450? About 450. Could be even 500, but I'm giving it... Uh, His, I take it, was the largest of these families. Well, I think uh, between uh, Vito's and uh, Combina's family, just about... Both large families. Uh, I'm talking about Gambino now. How Another. many soldiers belonged to the uh, little army that you were part of? Well, that I was with uh, Vito Genovese. Is, oh. uh, that's, uh, that's the family, see. Or oh, Aro Bugard in Italian. Now, within the ranks of this uh, army of crime, these soldiers, were they yeah. all at the same level, or did you have... Uh, Sergeants and captains and some uh, we had, Yeah, we had, uh, uh, for instance, uh, uh, I'll estimate it, we say, about uh, 20 to 25 gabarigines. And it's they? A, uh, some, uh, we call this a regine, like, uh, I don't know how to call it in English. Uh, a regine, like, uh, say, for instance, uh, I'll talk about my uh, regine. We had about 30. In under a loop, one lieutenant, like uh, sort of a, uh, oh, like a regiment, wait, wait, like a regiment. Let's yeah. just get some order here, and <coughs> one at a time. And if you'll address the yeah. chair, now, the chair will recognize you. Now there's other uh, lieutenants <coughs> may have sixty. Uh, it varies. Some may have forty. Some may have less. It all varies, you know. In other words, within this little army, they're broken up in companies or yeah. brigades yeah. or something. Right. Yeah. And uh, the whole army would be about 450, 500 under a bomb. Yeah, I, I rate, uh, say, uh, Gambina's family and Vito Genovese just about almost the same, you know, in, uh, as far as the many soldiers are concerned. One other question on that point. Do all of the soldiers know each other? Did you know who the rest of the army was? Well, uh, I wouldn't say all of the soldiers. Yeah. Uh, know each other. Most if, of you knew each if other. If they meet, one introduces another as you go along in life. Okay. Any further questions? Any questions at this point by any of my colleagues? Any other member? Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Mudd. I think it ought to be clear that we're not speaking about family in the usual sense. This is uh, not family in the sense of fathers and mothers. Sons no, and no, no, no. We're not speaking about that. This is simply an organization uh, of people who are not necessarily related to each other. Right. Uh, no, no. What you say, related? No, we're speaking about the scores and us. That's the expression they use, but not an immediate family by no means. It don't mean mother or father or an, uh, sister or brother or anything like that. Is that what you mean, Senator? Yes. Uh, now, may I ask one more question? Do these families meet uh, as such? Uh, do, do these 450 members, for example, of one family ever meet well, for the purpose of doing family business? Well, my, my family, I'm there 30 years. They never met, not a, as a whole. But we did have every Christmas a table like a dinner. My regime, my regime would consist of the 30 I was telling you about. And the, uh, and the rest of that, of... Uh, of the families here and there. They, some did and some didn't. But my family, the one I belonged to for 30 years, never met as a whole. 
so they didn't even know each other, really. Well, as I said, they would get to know each other as, you, as they went along. And, uh, you know, meet when I, you, you meet quite a bit uh, in life as you go, you know. When uh, you may be someplace and you know a member and he's with some member you don't know, he'll introduce them to you. Well, this is a secret organization. How do you how do you get to know that well, somebody is a member of the same family? He'll introduce them to you, for instance, uh, as a friend of ours. That means a member. Now, if he happens to be with someone that isn't a friend of ours, he would just simply say, meet a friend of mine, which means nothing. That's the code between us. So there was a code that enabled you to yeah. identify other members of the family? Yes, sir. Did you do anything for the family at all in this time, yeah, or did they I, just do things for you? Just go, uh, go out kill for them. You'd go out what? Kill for them. And you will tell us, in, in other words, when they asked you to do something like that, you will tell us about that later in the right, hearing. Right, right. Is that correct? And that's right. the only thing you did for them. That that's was the right. only relationship. Is that right? During the afternoon, Valachi told the committee of his progress from childhood to Cosa Nostra. Quit school at grade 7A, got his working papers at 15, lied about his age and worked honestly for one year as a river barge captain, and then in 1922 joined a burglary gang on 108th Street in Manhattan. His colleagues, Big Dick Amato, Giovanni Schicellani, known as Al Brown, Joseph Gagliano, known as Pip the Blind, Charles Albero, known as Charlie Bullets, and Frank Calacci, known as Chick 99. Committee counsel Jerry Adlerman is the questioner. Now... What type of burglary did you engage in at that time? Could you describe what the yes we were was? Uh, we were uh, we were crashing win uh, windows and uh, and uh, jewelry windows or fur windows, uh, taking expensive furs and suits, silk in that line. Now, where what area were you crashing? Uh, you mean what particular area? Yeah. Any any part of the city. Well, did you specialize in any areas like Madison Avenue or Lexington Avenue well, or Tremont want, Avenue or something? If you want to get, uh, you know, uh, good coats, you had to go to Fifth Avenue or uh, Sixth Avenue or uh, Madison Avenue. I see. And uh, what would be the nature of the operation? How would you how would you engage in this operation? Well, we used to throw a milk can in a window. We started that way and uh, grabbed the coats and run and um, get in the car and go. Uh, but, uh, did you use a car to do that? Yeah, they, uh, we developed a, a name. Uh, the police called us Minutemen. Why? Why did they call you the Minutemen? Because we uh, got away from the burglary either in a minute's time or less. Because uh, these uh, stores, most of them had what we call homes protection. And uh, they take about five to seven minutes. Did you ever did you ever time them to, to uh, before you made a, yeah, a real it. attempt? How yeah. would you do that? Well, I threw a brick in a window on 25th Street uh, once uh, because uh, the patrol uh, uh, office was at 125th Street West, and uh, I had something in mind at 125th Street East. So I threw a brick in to see how long it taken to come. Did you time them? Yeah, about five minutes. And then you felt safe, and if you could do well, I knew we can get away time. from there in less than a minute or a minute. How many of these type of robberies would you do in a week at that time? A couple a week. Two. Two, three. Any more than three? Well, according to how the weather was. Uh -huh. And uh, what was your function in the? Uh, I used to drive all the time. You uh, had a reputation as a. Driver of the getaway car? Yes. And uh, did you uh, have your car specially equipped in any way? I used, to, I used to get a special pinion gear for second speed. Just second speed. Just for second speed. Yeah. And you used to have a second gear, a second gear specially yeah, installed? Yeah, well, uh, at that time, uh, the mechanic used to call it a special pinion gear, uh -huh. which uh, instead of this, you know, instead of this big, would be this big. This, gear, this would be geared up in second gear a little higher so you can get away faster. That would pick up faster. You could go about how fast in that? Uh, well, at that time, uh, 60 miles an hour in second was a, hot, a lot of speed. That was a hot car. That was a lot of speed at that time. 
Well, uh, at this time now, we're not crashing windows anymore. Uh, they are getting in through the front doors. They discovered, uh, you know, some kind of tools. Uh, and we jimming what we, we use an expression, jimming the doors. And one of the tools broke, and they come over and asked me uh, if we got time to go back to Harlem. Uh, I said, sure, get in the car. As we were riding, uh, I only heard one shot, and, uh, and I was shot in the head. You were shot in the back of the head? Back of the head, yeah. All right. Now, uh, do you know what the gang did with you at that time? Yeah, well, naturally, I found out after. They, uh, uh, I, I, I was told that Charlie Bullets took the wheel, that they pulled me in the back of the car, and Charlie Bullets took the wheel. And uh, they placed me uh, in a street at 114th Street, Pleasant Avenue. And they fired about five, six shots in the air. What was the purpose of firing these shots? Well, uh, this way, when they picked me up, and they, uh, uh, the, the authorities would feel that I was shot in 114th Street. In other words, they, they pretended to shoot. They shot six bullets or six shots in the air, yeah. and then they, they felt that the authorities would feel that they, somebody tried to rub you out or yeah. kill you with yeah. that. And the this idea. way would, uh, would uh, take the attraction away from 174th Street and uh, St. Nicholas Avenue. I see. Well, what happened as a result of that? Well, they came back about an hour later. Naturally, they had to tell me all this when I got well. And I was still in the street. Nobody came. Nobody paid any attention to the shots. Is that right? Huh? Huh? Nobody paid any attention to the Nobody. shots. Nobody. Nobody called the police or anything? No. I see. And uh, what did they do with you then? Well, they told me they put me in a baby carriage in the hall, in the hallway, and uh, they went looking for a doctor. Finally, they... Uh, brought me to a doctor and they, they gave me a, a whole bottle of scotch for antistatic and, uh, and they took the, and the doctor took the bullet used, out. In other words, they used scotch as the anesthetic while they yeah. took out the bullet in the back of your head? Yeah. Huh? Yes. And was that done by a doctor? Yes. Do you know who the doctor was? I, I don't remember his name. You don't know. And uh, what did they do with you after that? Well, then they smuggled me into a hospital into a hospital on 86th Street. And while I was in the hospital, I was mumbling and giving uh, different stories and calling their names. Uh, uh, and I, once I would say I was shot while hunting, and another time I would say I was walking, you know, all kinds of stories. So they realized they had to move me out of the hospital, and they brought me... Was that because they felt you were talking too much? Yeah, well, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, they brought me to uh, 100th Street, Manhattan Avenue, a hospital called the Community Hospital. And uh, I stood there until the, I got released. I was there about three months, unco you know, semi-conscious. Semi-conscious. And um, they treated you in this hospital. Yeah. Do you know was... whether that was ever reported to the police? No, that never was reported. And uh, do you know uh, how much they paid the doctor for this? Yeah, uh, they told me they gave the doctor $2,500. Valachi resumes his public testimony Tuesday. After watching him for almost four hours today, it's easy to become sympathetic to him. His Damon Runyon aura, his fascinating glimpses into an unknown world, his defiance of a semi-military terrorist organization. But there is another side. As committee counsel Adlerman said today, there are so many murders, we can't do them all. We have to be selective. This is Roger Mudd in Washington. Good night. Over the years, since you uh, were associated with this group, have you worked and traveled in any state other than New York and the surrounding states there? Well, I uh, visit. I visit Buffalo and I visit Utica, New York. You haven't gone to the Middle West. I went to Arkansas years back. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I went to the Fed I see. I didn't understand what you did. I, I was trying to tell him I went to the Vets in Arkansas. You get, the did you get cleaned up down there? Yeah. You know the 21 day Vets? Yeah. Uh, All right. Have you made any, have you ever been in Chicago and made any contacts with I, the uh, Cousin Oscar? No, I stopped in Chicago on the way to Arkansas. Yes. Uh, 
Did you make any contacts with any of the... No, no German... contacts. I mean, in Munich, yes. No, I mean in, in Chicago. No, no contacts. Uh, have you ever been in Kansas City? No, not that I recall. And have you ever been in Omaha? No, sir. Right. Now, do you know whether or not there are members of the Cosa Nostra operating in Omaha? Senator, I never heard of Omaha. I never heard anything about Omaha. Does the Cosa Nostra deal with people who are not members. In other words, do they put someone in the numbers racket and cooperate with them, even though they are not members, uh, haven't been taken in as members? They do. In fact, they use a great many people. They do. Senator McIntyre. Uh, Joe, have you ever been to Boston? In Boston, yes. You ever hear of a man named Petriaca? Yes. Tell me, there's just a few... Uh, Questions in my mind. Yes, the uh, when you've been discussing contracts, that you get a contract. Yes. Is this something that's assigned to you by uh, by one of the bosses or lieutenants? Is it given to an individual of the family, or is it given to a group of individuals? Well, ninety-nine times out of a hundred, Senator, it's given to you by a lieutenant to the one who is in charge of that particular contract. It could be I. It could be anybody. But that one particular soldier will get uh, the contract, and then he picks himself who he wants to take along with him. Is and that what you mean, Senator? And this man who gets the contract does the actual planning of the operation, whatever that's, it may that's be. That's right. Yeah, he's in charge. Now, one other question. Did you ever propose anyone for the Casa Nostra? Oh, yes, I did. Were you ever present, not at the table, but were you, were you ever present at any other initiation other than your own? Well, right now, I never remember being present in that center. Edge of the table was, was a long table, and there was a gun and a knife on the table. And uh, How many were at the table? About 35 to 40. And sat me down and, uh, and, and made me repeat in Italian. Did they set you down at the table or in a chair out front? No, sat me down on the end of the table with Maranzana doing the talking, next to Maranzana. All right. Now, you sat next to him. Then what happened? Well, he had the knife and the gun on the table. I repeated some words he told me, but I only could explain what he meant. I could repeat the words, but they were in Sicilian. They were uh, what? In Sicilian. In you know, Sicilian. Sicilian. Didn't you well, repeated, but you didn't understand what they meant. Right. Then they explained. They explained what they meant. Who I, explained? Maranzana? Well, he could talk pretty good English, Maranzana. He talked 12 languages. Uh, he, a good... he went on to explain that you live by the gun and by the knife, and you die by the gun and by the knife. Yeah. What kind of a ceremony did you go through well, then, and uh, taking that oath? Well, then uh, he, uh, he, uh, he gave me a, a piece of paper, I suppose, you know, and burn it. And, uh, well, now, without burning the paper, just take a piece of paper there and show us what, what, how you did it. I, you don't even have to set the paper yep, fire, but yeah. take a piece of, give him a piece of yep. paper. Let demonstrate just what you did. In other ways, now this piece of paper, this what? piece of paper is burnt. This paper is burnt. Light it. Yeah. And then, uh, in your hand, you say. Well, again, they give you words in Italian, but I know what it meant. In other words, while you were repeating yeah. the words, you were burning this, the paper. Right. This is the way I burn if I expose this organization. And you were, that was uh, uh, you keep symbolic repeating. Of, of the fate that was to befall you if you betrayed the organization. Right. Until the piece of paper burned. You'd be burned to ashes. Right. All right. Now, what else did you do in that ceremony? Then after that, they... Uh, they uh, got around the table and they threw numbers. They drew what? Numbers. Between one to five, for instance. How you mean? Well, here, like this, throw three or one or five. Let's say the way you got a table there right now, everybody throws a number. In other words, we'd start down here at the table, well, somebody would hold up a number, each one would hold up some fingers. Uh, yeah, and we count the... We they count. could hold up as many as they wanted to. Uh, uh, up to five. 
Up to five. Well, right. that's about all the older well, ones. Well, let's say we start from you, Senator. Yeah, we start with me. And let's say it's 35, see, 40. And I put up two. Right. And he put up some. Yeah, you add it all up. Let's say and we you get, add it all up. Let's say we get a figure about 38. About 38, all and right. And we start from you. And let's say you go all around and it comes to uh, Senator the Senator Martin. next to you. Yeah, he's next to you. He is my, what you call, godfather. Then he, he, he picks your finger. Who, who? The godfather. He picks your finger? He picks your finger with a needle. Makes what? a little blood come out. In other words, that's the express, the blood relation. Supposed to be like brothers. Uh, that's the letting of blood. That's right. In other words, uh, symbolic of the fact you're well, willing to <clears throat> spill your blood. Right. To give your blood, to give your life. Yeah. As to what I'm telling you now, I need to go no further to say nothing else. This is what I'm telling you, what I'm exposing to you and the press and everybody. This is my doom. This is the promise I'm breaking that I, now my, even if I talk, I should never talk about this, and I'm doing so. That's my best way to explain. That is the highest oath you took. Right. In other words, that was the most sacred in, in this organization. Right. I want that you. That you would never tell this. Right. Right. Very well, let us proceed now with yesterday. We had, uh, were approaching at least, uh, leading up to the killing of Masseria. Not Masseria? Masseria. Masseria. No, Masseria. Jack, we, we had just gotten to the point where he had been taken to a restaurant somewhere. Is that correct? Yes. Sounds like Coney Island. At Coney Island. Now, who got him over there to the restaurant? His friends, Charlie Lucky and uh, Vito Genovese and Cyril Tavernova. Those three persuaded him. No, they were the important ones. I didn't understand you. They were the important ones. They were the important ones that got him to come over there to a dinner. And prior to that time, had he been uh, staying in pretty closely and not going out much? Senator, uh, uh, I was told that he had about three or four doors before his own brother could get to him. Had to go by what? Three or four doors before his own brother can get to him. Dogs, I see. Uh, what I was trying to determine was that you had been trying, actually, your, your side, the Maranzano group, had been trying to get to him to kill him for a good while, had they not? Oh, oh yes, Senator, yes. For some months. Yes, Senator. And when you were unable to do it, why, you, you finally got, as I understand you, this, uh, 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 Genovese and these others to uh, set him up for you. They, they set him up for, for Maranzano. They came to times, they came to times uh, that they would take care of. In other words, they didn't want the Maranzano's men should have any anything to do with it. They wanted to do it themselves. They wanted to do it. Themselves. That is, his own lieutenants, his you own people his own. around him wanted to do it. That's right. And they got him over to this uh, Coney Island restaurant. Right, I understand it took them about five to six months to get him there. It took them five or six months to get him yeah. in there. And that's when it happened. That's when it the happened. The Maran uh, Maranzano crowd didn't do that killing. No, they did not. It was the Missouri's his own his, people. His own people. That killed him at that restaurant. Right. Um, you were there... Very many present. Do you know you were not, you were not well, there? Uh, uh, well, uh, I wasn't there, but I uh, I uh, was told. Uh, I, uh, Zero was there. Vito was there. Charlie was there. A fellow named Cheech was there, and Joe Stretch was there. And uh, they even uh, somebody described to me. I don't remember who. Our Zero was so shaky. And put in the uh, the key in the ignition that they threw him off the wheel. Uh, see, I'm talking about Zero Tavernova, and uh, they threw him off the wheel. And uh, ever since then, Zero Tavernova was getting what we call buckwheats. Uh, like what? What we call buckwheats. You know, like uh, he was being stripped. Uh, 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 you know. A little at the time, he was being taken off. Uh, what they, his power was being taken away from him. And uh, after a while, he took it so hard that he died from a broken heart. I'm talking about Cyril Tavanova. 
He kind of lost face, did he, with his... Yes. And they replaced him at that time with Mike Coppola. Otherwise, they felt that he didn't have enough nerve. Well, yes, he, uh, he, he uh, sort of put it this way, he disgraced himself. He disgraced himself. Uh, and couldn't get the key. Uh, by showing his nervousness. Yeah, he was shaking. So uh, I got that from uh, the soldiers as we uh, go along in life. He started to tell us the details of the killing of uh, Mazaria as it he... was told to you. What does that say? You started to tell us the details of the killing at the <coughs> Coney Island restaurant. You were not there. He was killed by his own lieutenants. But you said you were told what took place. That's right. Well, you related to us as it was told to you. That's right. Do that. That's right. Go uh, ahead. I was told, uh, naturally, about five days after that, there was peace. Uh, you know, now we, uh, we, we're closing this war. And I was told, now the first story I heard was about Cyril, uh, uh, as I explained to you about uh, him shaking, putting, his key, uh, putting the key in, in the ignition. And, and uh, it wasn't about, say, about maybe, I don't think he lasted no more than about a year. No, no, what I'm trying to find out, was he shot? Was he bombed? Was he stuck well, with a blade? How was he killed? You thought about Juno Sari? That is correct. Oh, I thought you thought about Sarah. Yeah, he was shot. He was shot. Uh, in the restroom? In the restroom. Walking in by surprise? No, no, no. They were sitting down. They talked a while. And uh, and in, in the in the cause of, you know, of, of having conversation in between maybe a half hour and hour. I don't know how, last, how long it lasted. They shot him in, in this time. Any of them caught? No, uh, not that I know of. Unsol no one was caught. Unsolved crime, yeah. as far as you know. As far as I know, yes. Okay. What did the record of the New York police force show about it? Show that at, at 3.30 p.m. on April 15th, 1931, Giuseppe Masseria, alias Joe the Boss, last known to have resided at 65 Second Avenue, New York City, while sitting in a restaurant at 2715 West 15th Street in the Coney Island section of Brooklyn, was shot in the back and head by unknown persons who escaped. The cause of death were six gunshot wounds of the head and body. This he is an was shot case. in the back. In the back and in the head. In the back and in the head. Obviously, his assailant then was, uh, he had his back to his assailant. It would appear that way, so yes. So, it, it was in a restaurant. In the Coney Island section of Brooklyn. We are never able, with the police never able to determine, get any lead on who may have committed the crime? Uh, not to the point where there was evidence which could be presented to a grand jury. We didn't no, get sufficient to present to a grand jury. No, sir. Mm -hmm. You were here yesterday when Mr. Vallecci talked about the shooting of uh, Baker, I believe, was a fellow who... Uh, you shot him where the fellows were doing the painting. Who was it you shot from there? You didn't shoot him, but who was shot? Joe from? Baker. Baker. You were here when he described that murder, were you? Yes, sir. And he said there were three painters in there. Yes, sir. Uh, I was wondering whether or not you had been able to contact those painters. At this we, time, sir, no. Yeah. No, because it time. seemed this is a pretty hot lead. Uh, painters go on assignment. You could find out from the mm -hmm. records of the painting company who they were they would be able to have some kind of identification of the three people described by Mr. Vallecci. The painters saw the murderers, did they not, Mr. Witness? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. I just wondered if you had a report for the committee on that. No, you see, uh, Senator... That's pretty I, fast work. Yeah. I know that. I wouldn't expect uh, it. As I have explained, these are all active cases. Yeah. In view of the, the new leads which have been uh, recently made available, uh, these cases are under active investigation now. And because of that, uh, the district attorneys and the counties concern. There are five counties in New York City. Uh, they have uh, indicated that they would like us to cooperate with the committee to the extent of identifying the homicide which is spoken of, but they prefer that we do not go into any detail uh, concerning these active investigations at this time because it might possibly prejudice the case. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to ask Mr. Balanchi, uh, why weren't these three painters who were eyewitnesses to uh, the murder why weren't they killed? Uh, we never even dreamed about them, uh, Senator. In other words, you just I, the, the concentration was on the marked man and nothing else. 
That's right. I'm Joe Baker. Yes. What is the rule about that in the Casa Nostra, where you take a contract to kill somebody? What is what what uh, obligation do you have not to kill others that may be with them at the time? Well, uh, uh, as far as I could talk to Maranzan, he gave us orders all the time. He was always careful about hiding any innocent people, and uh, these painters. It wouldn't figure for them to talk. How many were killed during the during this fourteen month period of undeclared war and what you term declared war? Do you know how many people were killed altogether during that time on either side or both sides? Senator, I got the score. The score was we lost one. And they lost from forty to sixty. From forty to sixty. Yes. Uh, from 40 to 60 people killed as a result of this undeclared war and the declared war that followed after the two men uh, uh, were killed that identified your group as a killer. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, that these would be in the other group, the Mazara group. Well, you always have to call it Masari's group. Who? Masari's group. Masari's, that's the way you pronounce it. Uh, do you know the name of the one of your group that was killed? Ah, we lost the one in Chicago. He was Joe Aiello. He was from Chicago. Yes, he was killed. So, with the 1931 murder of Joe Massari, Salvatore Maranzano became the boss of all bosses in the New York area. A big five-day running banquet is held to raise money for the new boss and his soldiers. They raise $115,000, but Velacci says he gets none of it. He resumes his part-time burglary work to stretch the dollar, and then one day is summoned to the boss's home on Avenue J in Brooklyn. Velacci says Maranzano told him he had paid him nothing because he doesn't want to lose him. There is a new gang war coming. He didn't speak just as soon as I got in there. Nights were hanging around the hall until he was ready to speak. Uh, members were coming, and when he did get to speak... Then he got up there and he, ex and, and he started to explain about Masari and his groups, that they were killing people without just, he mentioned some names, names that I didn't know or never even heard of. For instance, he mentioned they killed Don and Deneen and without just, and they killed uh, yeah. another name he mentioned, uh, which is on the top on the right there, uh, Senator. Uh, Rena, I, I didn't know any of these men. And he was explaining how the Masari group was doing these things. Now it's going to be different. He said, uh, uh, we're going to have, uh, first we have the boss of all bosses, which is myself. Uh, then, Mar Maranzana now. Maranzana's talking. Then we have a boss, and then we have I mean, I'm, I'm, uh, an underboss, under the boss, and then we have an Ugabe regime. He was explaining all this. Now, uh, if if uh, a soldier, naturally we have the soldier, if a soldier wants to talk to a boss, he shouldn't take the privilege for him to try and go direct to the boss. He must first speak to the Ugabe regime, then the Ugabe regime, and if it's required, it's important enough, the Ugabe regime will make an appointment for the soldier. And he went out to explain the rules. This is what I call the second government center. He was telling you how it is going to operate from was, now on. He was uh, describing how it's going to operate. And, and the banquet followed right after this meeting. How long, how long did the banquet meeting last? The banquet lasted. Uh, it was a five-day uh, banquet, Senator. In other words, I don't mean that it ran continuously for five days. Uh, uh, for instance, you come in early in the evening and close maybe three, four, five in the morning, and then reopen again the next day. For five nights. For five uh, nights. Five. You had, you had a banquet. Right. Right. Uh, what occurred with respect to that banquet? What was the purpose of it primarily? Well, if you well uh, uh, the purpose was he just uh, uh, the money was supposed to be meant for the original soldiers. And from 
from self. The original is what I mean, which was about 15. They were about 12. Now there's three, three of us there. It makes it about 15. We're supposed to be to give these boys a chance, being they were away and now they broke, and for himself. That was the purpose, and to be, and so he'd be recognized uh, as, you know, the boss. And uh, it was. And naturally, uh, they went to a lot of expense. Uh, they understand that, and that's what was the point, the reason for the banquet. So it was a, a banquet to raise money and also to acknowledge uh, Maranzana as the boss of bosses. Right. They all were paying tribute to him and honoring him. Right and recognizing him as the boss of bosses. Right. And this was to demonstrate it. Is that correct? What was that, Senator? This was to demonstrate it. That's right. To let everybody know that right. he was recognized as boss of bosses. Well, right. What, uh, what uh, you, you said is also to raise money. Was yes, money well, raised during that time? If so, how and from I, whom? I understood uh, it was 115,000. He, uh, he sent out, for instance, a, a thousand tickets to Al Capone, and Al Capone sent 6,000. He sent a thousand tickets to uh, Buffalo, and they also sent 6,000. And Charlie Lucky himself sent 6,000. Them are the big amounts I know. So he, he told me that we can't get along. He meant we can't get along with Charlie Lucky and Vito and them, and he, he gave me a list. He says, we got to get rid of these people. Got to get rid of them. We got to get rid of them. So uh, on the list was, uh, I'll try to remember as I go along. Al Capone, Frank Costello, Charlie Lucky, Vito Genovese, Vincent Mongo, Joe Adonis, uh, Dutch Schultz, uh, These were all important names at the time. Some 10 or 12 altogether? Uh, 10, 10 or 12, yes. Now he tells me, uh, I forgot to tell you, Senator, uh, there was a rumor passed up in the office a little while before, I'll say a week, a few days before. I, as I'm talking, I remember that. Not to come up in the office with any guns. Nobody come up there with any guns because they expect the police up there. I got, got to talking with some of the members and I said, I didn't like that order. So he said, this other fellow, whoever may have been, he said, what do you mean? I said, I don't know. I says, I'm afraid uh, that they're trying to prepare us to be without any guns. I just don't like it. That's the way I talk. Well, we let it go that way. Now, when he told me about the mattress, I, and he told me that he was going to have the last meet at 2 o'clock in the office tomorrow. Now, by mattress, did that mean that you would hole up in the house and just sleep on mattresses somewhere? Well, you see, that's that, the way, that's Give us a description of what yeah. you mean with you see, they were, we were using mattresses, for instance, uh, uh, he, uh, when they moved from one house to another. Now, the purpose of that is you never know when you're going to go in a minute's notice. So they used to use mattress, but naturally you always had the bedroom. See, that was when I was at his headquarters. That's the meaning of mattress. So that's why I understood. Yeah, did I give it to you clear? I think so. Go ahead. So uh, I said, uh, uh, can I talk to you? Don, uh, to say, we called him in Italian. Don Dried. Don Dried means Don Sarato. See? I said, can I talk to you? Well, he was a kind of a man you could talk to. Uh, he was in a kind of a man that he thought he was a general you can't say anything to. See? I said, can I talk to you? I said, look. After all, if I lose you, I'm out in the street. I got all reasons, all reasons to worry. I said, uh, must you go on this appointment? Can't you let, can't you let, uh, Angel Garusso go? I said, if it's this, your last, 
with me. He's not. I got to go. Now, you were trying to keep him. I'm going. trying to tell him, if this, if this is your last meet, why should you go when the other ones, they usually send the underboss? In other words, I'm trying to tell him, uh, after, if you got something in mind, why jipiotize yourself for the last time? Well, he's not. Who me. was he to meet with? Vito Genovese and Charlie Lucky at the office on uh, 46th Street. Whose office? Manzano's office. He was going to his office to meet them. On uh, next day. At 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. All right, go ahead. So I, now, he's telling me uh, about uh, what we're going to do, uh, how big we're going to be, and a lot I wasn't interested at Senate at this time. And uh, I feel, uh, as I say, I was away. Now I'm back again. I wasn't too happy. But I, I, uh, I went along. He told me I should call the office at a quarter to two. Were you to be there, meet him there at two? No, he told me to call the office. Call the office. At a quarter to two. And that afternoon... I called the office at quarter to two, and Charlie Buffalo answered the phone. He said that everything was all right. He said, I need not go down. So that day I met the, the get came around, and uh, he decided to go to Brooklyn. We knew a couple of girls in Brooklyn. I said, it's a good idea. We got nothing to do. We took a ride to Brooklyn. And we were away all that day, and all we got back in uh, New York about 12.30, 1 o'clock in the morning. And I, we landed in uh, Charlie Jones' restaurant on 14th Street, 3rd Avenue. And uh, while, while we went in the restaurant, we had the gloves with us. When we went in the restaurant, uh, I noticed uh, there was uh, like some, oh, some guy walked in and looked us over, he walked out again. Then I noticed another guy walked in looking us over. All right. I looked at the gap, he looked at me. And he says, I don't know. So Charlie Jones, which is a, sort of a, a businessman, like he ran crop games, uh, he, owned, <laughs> uh, he owned dance halls, and he was in that line of business. See? So uh, he moved over to me, he told me, go home. Just and I see. walked outside, I looked at the gap. I said, well, what do you think? He said, I don't know. He says, we'll break it up. I said, all right, I gave the girls some, some money. I told them to go home, back to Brooklyn. And I, and I went home alone, and I left the gift on there. So when I, uh, I rode through Lexington Avenue very slowly, uh, when I reached in Harlem, see, it's the same place where we used to hang out. And I noticed there was about six or seven boys on the avenue. As I passed by, they, they whistled at me, but I didn't stop. I kept going. So I went home. I lived about two, three blocks away from there. About uh, 10, 15 minutes later, three of the boys that I uh, proposed and put in were all, were all shot up, but they weren't hit. They only had powder marks. Powder marks? Powder marks all over. They didn't have bullet marks, just powder marks. Just powder marks. All right. It's amazing. All three were missed. So I, I said, uh, were you on the corner when they whistled? What are their names? Do you want to give their names? Yes. Bob Jones. Uh, that wasn't Charlie Jones, uh, the one that's not read. Not Buck Buck Jones. Jones. All right. Piggy Loggins and Johnny D. Johnny who? Johnny D. Bellis. All right, go ahead. Well, I, I had the newspaper under my arm. I still can't figure it out. All of a sudden, I... Well, see, when I went in the house, I was laying on a couch trying to figure out these moves. I didn't even open up the newspapers. Well, when they come in, all of a sudden, I happen to look, and I see headline, Park Avenue murder. Well, I jumped that. I knew we had the office on Park Avenue. That's the first time I read about Manninzahn being killed in his office that afternoon.
So another boss of all bosses was dead, and another power struggle had ended. The new boss who emerged at Valachi was Salvatore Luciano, alias Charlie Lucky, and his underboss, Vito Genovese, alias Don Vitone. During the afternoon session, Valachi was questioned more closely about the death of Maranzana. Valachi said his information, second-hand, had come from Bobby Doyle, the one from Hartford. There was four Jews went up there, and they posed as policemen. And, they, uh, and he found out. Now, how he found out when he's telling me the story. And they posed as policemen. I said, you remember the time they passed the room with no guns up there? He said, yeah, yeah. Remember I was suspicious? He said, yeah. Well, they brought Menon's on in the other room while the other two stood with the crowd. There was quite a crowd up there to talk business. In other words, they posed as police, showed him a badge that they want to talk business with him, you know. So he agreed. But when they got in the other room, Manzana seemed to have gotten wise. And they intended only to cut him, not to shoot him. And Manzana went for a pistol. He had a pistol on him. And they, had, they were forced to use a shot on him before they cut his throat. So I was running away with it. Now I, 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 I correct him. Well, now you said uh, the Jews killed him. Is that right? What's that? The Jews, yeah. Who, who had uh, well, later on, dressed uh, as policemen. They acted as policemen. They posed as policemen. Posed as policemen. Right. And uh, were they uh, members of Casa Nostra? No. Well, how did they get into the picture? Well, they were close to, they were very close to Charlie and Vito at that time. That's my Alensky's crew. They were close to Vito? Vito and, uh, and uh, Charlie Lucky. They were close to them. But were they, did you get any information they were employed to commit this murder? Well, uh, uh, Senator, uh, they seem to uh, work together at times. See, they have trouble of their own later on, which I'll explain. And Vito and Charlie helped them when they had trouble among themselves. Balachi testified he learned six years later that one of the four killers was Red Levine. He said Levine himself told him of the killing. Within a week of that murder, Balachi had switched gangs again, this time joining up with Luciano and Genovese. Valachi returns next week to Capitol Hill. We shall return later tonight for another special report. This is Roger Mudd in Washington.